So, thanks everyone for coming. And are we actually on WebEx at the moment? Yeah. Almost. We are? Yeah. Okay, well, the presentation will come on. Oh, yeah. So, um, welcome to the uh, seminar today at the OECD, where we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Per Espen Stockners, uh, who is. Um, to, to hold to hold up his book <laughs> to talk to us today about um, what we think about when we try not to think about global warming. Uh, Professor Sognus started out life as a psychologist, and but has also branched out into organisational theory, philosophy, mythology, and is the author of several books around uh, issues at the intersection of these different disciplines. So, uh, without further ado, and while we wait for your presentation to uh, be techno te technologically brought into the into the into the WebEx. We might ask you to start. Thank you. So it's a pleasure being here today and uh, pleasure sharing some of the latest findings uh, from uh, I would say an exploding area of research, which is not just climate science important enough, but the science of how people respond to climate science. So you could call that the science of science communication. How do you communicate in a way that actually uh, gets people to integrate it and act upon it and not just uh, hear it and uh, that it float past? So the question that's been driving me and my research over the last um, 10 years or so um, is this question. Are humans inevitably short term? Is it the case that with our you know, evolutionary makeup and our psychology, is it the case that we always want to have our cake now and not to think much about the cake in the future? And uh, the climate issue seems to indict us in the sense that, um, yes, we do, we do indeed want all the cake now and not to think much about uh, what our children and our grandchildren would have. But uh, it's not always the case that humans act for the short term. Often we do act for the long term. The question can be put more positively, which is, under what conditions do humans actually act for the long term? And it's good avoiding that echo, thank you very much. So I don't have to <laughs> hear my voice too much. Now, you know, um, as economists know, and I have also been working a lot with economists to have a PhD in economics myself, uh, solving the climate problem is not all that difficult. It's quite easy, actually. You, you slap a proper price on carbon, and you use some of that revenue to maybe educate uh, women all over the world and then distribute the rest back to the people. But this simple solution that, eco that economists have been pushing for years and years, carbon pricing, just doesn't seem to make it. Why is it, after 25 years of uh, climate science communicating, combined with economists talking about the carbon price, we still don't have it? And it seems that people are not willing to support that long-term measure of sufficient carbon pricing to curb and kick our carbon habit. Um, so, part of the reason for this is the way climate science, and by the way, economic science, has been communicated. So, one of the graphs that we hope to think is working is from the IPCC fifth assessment report, which shows two futures. One future is the business as usual scenario towards 2100, the track we're currently on, pointing to a four degree warmer world. Now, a four degree warmer world is very different from the world we have now. And to really get that point across, IPCC, being scientists, gave it the incredibly communicative name of RCP 8.5. Now, did you get inspired to action? They also have a beautiful vision of the world. It's called RCP 2.6. It's a world in which we remain more or less, as we like it, below 2 degree warmer. And we're talking about the year 2100 here. Now, why is it that people just don't get it? How come that as human psychology don't immediately say, RCP 8.5, oh no, we must put the carbon price in place. And beautiful visualizations have been made as well, where you see the whole world warming gradually uh, from a blue to the world of the 1850s to 
now it's already, and uh, 2100 is on our way with even redder warmer world. So I'll share my desktop here and then see if we manage to get uh, these. Oh, yes. There we go. So here we have uh, the scenarios we were talking about. And um, most people actually get a big yawn when they hear about this story for the umpteenth time. Um, for over 25 years, scientists have shared uh, these kind of graphs, telling people that if you continue as today, the world will burn. Now, what has been the impact on people? What has been the impact on people's concern and their willingness to support climate policy? And what we do know is that, I'll skip this, uh, is that since 1989, 7 out of 10 people actually in Norway were very or somewhat concerned about greenhouse effects and climate change. Now, as the years have gone by and you've published more and more scientific studies and five IPCC reports, we've actually come down to or a little bit below 5 out of 10, 50%. Is this just Norway or whatever? Unfortunately, there has been not consistent international surveys that give us reliable data from all cultures in the world, but we have similar from the US, which is almost bi-yearly. How much do you personally worry about the greenhouse effect of global warming? In 1989, somewhere between 6 and 7 out of 10 were either a great deal or a fair amount worried or concerned. And now it's down to below six, no, almost five or 50%. And if you look internationally, how concerned are you about? Uh, the, this is for 2015 data. In the US, they are mostly worried now about Islamic extremism, less about international financial instability, and even less about climate change. The EU is now even higher on Islamic extremism. Asia is, has Islamic extremism there, but still climate change is high. And Latin America and Africa are the regions that have the highest concern about climate change. And globally, in a way, climate science has succeeded in communicating to 46% of the global population that climate change is indeed an important threat to be concerned about. But it seems to be huge regional variations. And this graph shows different countries' responses to the question, the climate change we're currently seeing is largely the result of human activity. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Or you don't know? As you can see, countries such as China or Latin American countries, and Argentina, they come out very high on agree. But countries such as Australia, Great Britain, and US come out very high on the disagreement. So there seems to be some kind of strange correlation between speaking English and disbelieving climate <laughs> science. Um, and of course, this asks for, for, for understanding. How can it be too that if you ask the public, particularly in richer countries, are scientists now in agreement about climate science and the human cost and, and uh, important, well, 55% of our Western population say that climate scientists agree. 45% believe they still disagree. While in reality, more than 97% of scientists actually agree on global warming. So, this is what I call the psychological climate paradox. How can it be that over the last 25 years, we have more certain data, but people's level of concern actually is falling. It seems to go counter our rational expectations of what humans are. The more we know about this, the less we support climate and the less we concern ourselves. So in order to answer this, I surveyed about 350 articles, studies, from uh, psychological and sociological and social anthropological journals, peer-reviewed, saying what are the main five defenses the psychological defenses that keep us from engaging. And also, what do we know from the evidence of what actually works? What makes people engage and not let out a big yawn, such as with the RCP 8.5? And I've summarized these into five words, five defenses, or starting with D. So let's say you have a climate message here saying that now, oh, the, the West Antarctica ice shelf is now melting, and we will have a committed a two-level two meter sea level rise. 
is this message or the, oh, we're now we're all more than 400 ppm in the atmosphere. Does this strike home to people? And why doesn't it? Well, there are five barriers. The first we call distance. The second, if you pass the distance, a new barrier called doom barrier. The third barrier is the dissonance barrier. And the fourth, denial. And in order to have the last one also on D, I had to cheat a little bit. <laughs> so I call that identity. So let, you, let me quickly walk you through these five barriers that condenses these three or four hundred articles uh, on psychology of climate change. Firstly, as I showed you with this graph, when IPC speaks about the year 2100, or economists, or environmentalists speak, you know, honestly, when did you last personally make a decision on behalf of not this century, but the next century in your life? Well, very few of us did, or do. So, this way of communicating it unintendedly has the effect of putting it outside our time span, our time horizon, as, as ordinary humans. My, my to-dos are mostly about this week and next week, not 2100. Second, it's positioned unintended again as far away in space. This is a glacier. This is the front page of the IPCC AR Working Group 1 report. Um, and who, how many of, of the public have been on a glacier? How many live in the vicinity of one? How many have been to Arctic, Arctic areas? You know, quite a few of you, but very few. So un unintendedly, we communicate that this is something happening far away from us. It's far away in time, it's far away in space, and it happens to somebody else. It's not me. I don't know these people. These are from the, this is from the picture from the, the cyclone, uh, Hanyan, hitting the Philippines. Uh, I don't know anybody who knows them. I don't know anybody who knows somebody who knows them. And what we know from psychology is that the more distance there is between me and somebody else, the less empathy we feel for these people. It's a very, very well-known psychological fact. So it hits somebody else far away from me, and also I hear about these negotiations all the time. Uh, and, um, you know, Warsaw, Lima, Paris, to whatever. And there are these big guys speaking about climate change, heads of government, negotiators, CEOs of big corporations. I don't know anybody of them, and they are responsible for this, actually. It's their decisions, it's not me. So, in a way, it's them making these decisions, it's not me. Whatever I do, I can't influence these people. So the responsibility of climate change has been put on somebody else. All this makes for what we call psychological distancing. The effects of the psychological distancing, which is a very well-established finding now in climate psychology, creates a low feeling of personal risk. So if I am asked, is global warming a big threat to our planet? I may say yes. Do you personally worry about it? I say no. So we've learned from what being, some say, politically correct to say that global warming is a problem, but does it affect me? Well, no, I don't really feel like that, because I've distanced myself through the way climate has been communicated. This reduces the sense of urgency, and it gives climate typically a low issue priority. So if we compare the issues that people care about, that the politicians look at, you know, you have uh, economic growth or criminality or terrorism or education or health as the top issues and then comes climate change as 14 out of 15, typically on many surveys. This is the effect of psychological distancing. But let's say you get past this. Let's say you have a hurricane or a flood or you say climate change is here, it's now, it's affecting us. Do you then solve it? Well, the problem is that the next barrier is called the doom barrier. And the doom barrier is the overuse of catastrophe and apocalyptic framings in our communications. One study from uh, the Oxford Institute of Journalism by James Painter showed that more than 80% of all media articles were using the catastrophe or apocalypse framing for communicating climate science. And of course, in the beginning, this sells magazines, but in the long term, it makes people from overuse of apocalypse habituate. You get used to hearing about it. It's like crying wolf, wolf. And then after hearing about it, it gives you maybe somewhat fear and uncomfortableness, a guilt feeling maybe, and then you start to avoid the issue. 
So, it, oh, here comes the climate news again. I don't want to hear about that. Let's switch channel or let's think about something else or talk about something that's nice. And finally, after hearing about climate change from some people over and over again, I start to stereotype them. It's not me, it's them. They're doomsday prophets. They love doomsday prophets. Here comes the typical environmentalist. And what they're saying really is that humans are a pest. Save the planet. The best thing we could do is go kill yourself. I don't like that, those negative guys. So that's what happens with the doomsday. Third is the dissonance barrier. What is dissonance? That is when what we know conflicts with what we do. And we've had over the entire previous century built up a lifestyle based on oil, energy, coal, gas that was okay. We didn't know about these things. So we've looked into an infrastructure of high energy lifestyles. So I fly, <clears throat> I drive my car, I eat the meat, I live in a house, I need a lot of power. And all my friends, they also fly and drive. And my government, they want to pump even more oil and gas. You know, so if it was really serious, you would do something with it. There's this conflict, both in myself and in my friends or around me. And there was a little film made about this. I don't know if this will come through in sound, but if it doesn't, I'll skip it. Is there sound? No, no, let's skip the film. No problem. <laughs> because we have this image here showing that, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, however much I admire him, very quickly people leap onto the dissonance. Because I care so much about climate change, this is the way I live. And of course, this epitomizes what we all do, at least in richer countries. We have lifestyles that are climate or carbon intensive, and we talk about climate. So we have this, we feel like hypocrites. If I criticize people who use oil, but then I use oil myself, how do I live with this? And um, the reason, actually, it's easy because we, what we do is self justify ourselves and then we start to adjust our attitudes. So, what we know from studies of smoking, for instance, is that if I smoke, I typically have a more positive attitude to smoking. If I drive a car, I have a positive attitude to building more roads. If I go on a bike, I typically support more bike lanes. So, actually, in the case of dissonance, we have this situation where behavior drives our attitudes more than knowledge. So it doesn't help to give people new knowledge because it doesn't translate to, to attitudes. Behavior speaks louder than knowledge. And this dissonance creates a market, so to speak, for misinformation. We do know there's been a well-funded, well-oiled misinformation campaign against climate science. But it's based on little brain power, little data, and why do people buy it? We have billions of dollars in research on climate and hundreds of climate communicators, yet a few people seem to with some come up with contrarian messages that really people want to hear. And the answer is dissonance, because if I disbelieve climate, if I say, you know, climate has always changed, or I think it's the sun, really. I heard about a scientist saying it's the sun uh, causing this. Then I can feel better about my behavior. There is no longer a dissonance, because now I've taken away the knowledge that criticizes my behavior. So by self-justification, I can believe, I use climate denialism or climate contrarian messages to self-justify myself so I can continue living and driving my car as I want to do. Further, if I have dissonance for too long, I end up with denial. And then the, this avoidance of the dissonance has become automatic. So in the denial, I will uh, quite simply um, not think much about it. And I will prefer to listen to people and be among other people who also not think much about it. So when Ted Cruz, for instance, says that, you know, the alarmists and global warming got a problem because the science doesn't back them up. He knows this is not scientifically correct. But... <laughs> The issue is really not about the science, it's about the social contract. We agree not to talk about this issue. And that's why he has to say it. So, denial is really a cultural and psychological phenomenon in which we agree not to talk about certain issues. So, and it plays on a basic psychological mechanism in us, that is, that we are perfectly able to live with a certain knowledge as if we don't know it. So denial is not just saying no, or the deniers are not just 
immoral, ignorant, stupid people. The denial is a basic human capacity we have to live with knowledge, troubling knowledge, as if we do not know it. So therefore, I try to avoid using the word denial, a particular deniers, as a category. I try to use either contrarians, um, I'm not using skeptics because, you know, um, skepticism is uh, a very much scientific uh, in grade. Science is really systematized skepticism and mainstream scientists are skeptical. Rather, I think the right use, word is to use there is resistance. From a psychology, we know that we have resistance towards changing. I don't want to change myself. I don't want to change the way I live. And if I really take in that my child today, science tells me that when he gets old, the world may be warmer than in the previous three million years. And my lifestyle contributed to that. That is a troubling knowledge to live with. And I can hear that and I think, oh, that's terrible. But by Monday morning, I live as if I don't know it any longer. So there's a level of denial in most lives of us. Even if we are aware of it, and when we hear a science, climate scientist, we live as if we do not know. Lots of things to be said about that, but I want to be, give the overview here. So let's move on to the fifth barrier, which is the identity issue. Since the year 2000, we've seen a politicization of the climate issue being linked by political and personal values. So to illustrate this, I want to use this car issue. So here on the right, you have a little car for tree huggers. And then you have a proper car on the left uh, for us who value freedom. And <laughs> by the way, I prefer small government and big cars to big government <laughs> and smaller cars. And what happens if then some environmentalists start to drive this car, this little car, and it comes up behind my, uh, my, my rear bumper and pushes me? Well, I get pretty frustrated, so, but luckily, I have something called rolling coal, which is um, uh, a kit I can install in my diesel engine. So when uh, an electric car or a Prius or whatever comes up into my bumper, I have a button inside. Uh, it's called a Prius repellent, this kit. Um, and it injects extra diesel into my engine. So when he's too close, I can cover him in a, in a cloud of suit. <laughs> and it costs just $500, and for this little sum, I, I'm able to demonstrate very clearly what I mean about uh, this uh, criticism of my lifestyle. They want to take my big SUV away from me. So climate science must be wrong, because otherwise I can't drive my car. Now, this is what we call identity protective cognition. And we see it not just in the extreme case of this, but also typically when we discuss electric cars, and they may be seen as, you know, oh, they're not as clean as they say, or it's just another way to get more um, uh, subsidies, or uh, really, if you take a proper view of it, uh, they're all coal-fired when you drive them. So they're not that good. So climate becomes a political issue where you have to defend your lifestyle against a perceived criticism from scientists or environmentalists. This goes pretty deep, and we call this the confirmation bias. So if you take a test of a few thousand people like Dan Kahane did in this study, I ask them, is the Earth getting warmer? A, mostly because of human activity, such as burning fossil fuels, or B, mostly because of natural patterns in the Earth's environment? Now, to give you a hint, I've underlined the correct answer, which is A. And if you then divide the answers according to the level of science intelligence, you see that with increasing science intelligence, you get more correct responses. But the interesting thing happens when you split this total group of a few thousand people according to their values or their identity. Do I have egalitarian values with a liberal outlook? Or do I have individualistic values with a conservative outlook? And the more I have egalitarian values, the more I get the answer correct immediately. But if I have individualistic values, the more science intelligence I have, the more wrong do I get it. How can that be? With more knowledge and science intelligence, the more wrong you get the answer. And the answer seems to be this, that 
I will use my science and intelligence and my filters to reinterpret the facts so they fit my identity. If the facts conflict with my identity, facts lose. Or put it this way, identity will eat facts for breakfast any day if they conflict with my values. So this has to do, how do we then communicate climate to those part of the population that perceive climate science to be wrong because they have implications such as more regulation, more taxes, and more government? This is a core barrier to change. So these are the five barriers, distance, doom, dissonance, denial, and identity. So let me then work on to the solutions. How do we break through these barriers? Something is happening with my screen here. You are no longer connected to the event, automatically reconnecting. And um, <clears throat> maybe the technicians can fix this. I don't know. Drop that again, Shane. Uh, but I'll walk on. To, you're now the host of this event. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> there we go. All power to you. All power to you. So, excellent. So, how do we bypass these barriers? And let me talk. Uh, through them, because each of them have uh, an evidence-based solution. And these five solutions are um, social, using the power of social network, we must make climate a social issue, and then we must make it more simple to act in a climate-friendly way. And thirdly, we must use supportive framings, framings that do not generate resistance, such as the catastrophe and cost framings the favorite fair framings of, of science and econ economists. Fourthly, we need a better storytelling that makes this about a story about the society we want in the future, and not a green or environmental just story. And fifthly, we need signals that help us see the societal responses, not just the climate system behavior. So let me walk you through these five solutions, all with S. First, we use the social networks. How do we do that? Well, there are things such as social norms and social networks and the feeling of being together with people alike and who are like me. So one study, for instance, shows that if one house in a neighborhood get solar panels on their roof, and then you study how long time does it take before the houses neighboring this also get solar panels. Then you see that the likelihood of them getting a solar panel is much higher than the average in the country. Thank you so much. So it seems that solar panels are contagious. They don't just happen randomly across the world or the society, they happen spreading in circles around certain areas. One other famous study was done into how people do energy efficiency or conserve power. What makes people engage in energy efficiency behaviors? It was done by Bob Cialdini and his team in Arizona and started and it's spreading and been replicated many times. They divide the households, a few thousand households into four groups by random. The first group is told you should conserve power because it's sustainable. It's good for the planet. And otherwise, we'll all burn. Thank you so much. Here we have five strategies. And I'll now show you the different experimental conditions. So the first group were asked, the second group were asked, please think about your children. You should conserve power and be energy efficient because it's good for your grandchildren and future generations. The third group were asked, if you conserve power, you'll save money. It's profitable. And the fourth group were told how much they use compared to their neighbors. So which four of these conditions do you think have the largest and most long-term reduction in energy? Yeah, I see four fingers in the air and you're right. This is the correct answer and it's been repeated a number of times in terms of energy, in terms of water savings, recycling behaviors, whatever. You see, if my neighbor is doing it, then it's important. 
It's no longer just some signed egghead in a white coat telling me what, how to live. But, hmm, he's better than me. I don't like that. So I want to beat them, and I want to be acknowledged for beating them. So this is how they do it. This is my behavior, my, my energy use. This is the most efficient neighbor, and this is all neighbors. And that, because I'm better, I get two smileys. That's great. If I'm below average, there is no frown, you know, a bad, sad face. Because if there, I get a sad face, then I say, you know, this is just bullshit. I don't like this. <laughs> so the point, till, the point from social science is that people don't just want to conserve energy because, to be, because they are sustainable people, but they want to be acknowledged for conserving energy. And this is the whole shift. We must give climate science a social dimension. And both climate scientists and economists have a problem with that. Because one talks about the PPM and the other talks about the cost of CO2 mitigation per ton of CO2. And none of these figures have a social dimension to them, the way people experience it. So one more example of making it social, if we need to move the messenger closer to somebody who people have confidence in. For instance, sports people. So this is called, called this thing alliance called Green Sports Alliance. And what they do is to bring together all the footballers, the ice hockey people, the soccer teams, um, volleyball, whatever. And then they make the sports event green and ask the sports stars to uh, express climate friendly attitudes. In this way, you spread the message through the social networks rather than just cognition alone. So check out Green Sports Alliance if you want to look at an example of how to communicate climate science in a very social way. So the next is simple. Um, I'll do a bit quickly because this has to do with um, behavioral economics and nudging. It's kind of difficult for people to um, pick the most climate friendly products in shops, etc. Um, because there's a lot of information processing to do. But if we could rearrange the decision architecture so that Without thinking, people would choose the right thing. You know, the bad news is that people are making, making unconscious, automated, destructive choices in their consumer behavior life. The good news is that we can make people do unthinking, automatic, good choices if there's a default value, so you don't have to care much about it. So like printing, if this, all printers had a default two-sided printing, you would automatically use 15%, maybe 20% less paper, and that's about a million tons per year, both for US offices and EU offices, according to this study. So the point is not the CO2 reduction, but it is the automated positive climate behavior, and how that supports our climate attitudes through reducing dissonance. One other favorite example I have is the purchase of plane tickets. More, less than 1% of people today buy a carbon offset or carbon credit for their plane rides. Why? Well, because after going through all the hassle of purchasing a ticket, who wants to go another hassle to buy carbon offsets? I don't have time for that. I might support it, but, you know, can't bother. So I made a help there. You can't see it, but that's part of the point. If you look down here, it says, check here to not pay carbon offset. Mm -hmm. In that way, you flip the default around, so it's automatically included if you don't actively read and act on it. That would probably shift it from 1% to maybe more than 50% of the people buying carbon offsets, according to psychological studies and nudging. So, supportive framings. I mentioned 80% of the media had catastrophe framings. What we need to do is to shift those from cost and catastrophe, the favorite framings of uh, economics and climate scientists, into three positive framings. And these are health, insurance, and, or risk management, if you will, and opportunity. First, health. If you remember that um, a lot of people's health uh, have respiratory problems, stress, heat-related stresses, there are more infectious diseases, there is more um, even mental health-related issues, and Lancet, the medical journal called Climate Change, the main health challenge of this century last year. And then we should also remember that a lot of behaviors that are good for health also is good for the climate, such as clean air locally, um, 
less meat consumption, more biking, walking, less car driving, all these things benefit both health and climate at the same time. So next time you speak about climate, please remember to make it a health issue. It's about human health, it's not about glaciers or uh, melting Antarctic shelves. You make the issue local and you make it feel relevant to people and their kids and their area. So check all the health related framings that are now coming out of the research, how that creates a positive engagement, clean air, better health with less climate change. And then I'd like to use this example to show how we should talk more about the opportunities. Rather than 80% catastrophe, we need to shift that to maybe 80% opportunity and 20% catastrophe. Because I use this case here, solar roadways. You might have heard of it, maybe not. It's a new company, a new technology to use to make smart roads. So we have smartphones, we have smart houses. Why can't we have smart roads that actually respond through LEDs? These are not paint, these are lights. So they light up red if somebody's crossing the, the pedestrian crossing. Uh, they can change the breadth of the biking lane depending on how many bikes there are. And um, it can also change the, the direction of the lanes depending on what time of the day it is. So why not make smart cities that make uh, have smart traffic based on roads that generate the power the cars need on it? And people loved this idea. So the, the, the video went viral. It had more than 25 million views. And people were throwing millions and millions of dollars at this startup, even if they couldn't prove anything. And all the economists said, it's too costly. It's expensive. It would never work. People didn't care because they loved the opportunity. And that's my psychological point. I'm not saying this is going to solve the climate problem. I'm saying it gives the climate issue a positive image by the opportunities it embodies. It shows what kind of societies we would like to live in. And this generates a yearning to be part of that. And of course, Tesla is all about using that message. So they took a battery, the most boring thing in the world, a, a square box, and they made it into a design product, making people want to have a battery on their wall back home. How do they do that? Well, it's by selling energy independence, energy freedom, uh, a life where you have more uh, control over your own energy consumption, and making it into a design product that's high-end, that's enviable, that has a status. This is using the opportunity frame. Similarly with Google, they, buy, they bought up Nest, a smart thermostat, because they want to be part of the Internet of Things, the smart houses. And of course, the Chinese try to get away from uh, traffic jams by selling millions and millions of electric bikes per year. They're selling 40 to 50 million electric bikes per year, having a target of 350 million electric bikes by the year 2017. So there are lots of opportunities that are smarter, climate-friendly society gives us. And my main point is that we should talk at least 75% about that and 25% about the catastrophe. Because that's what psychology is about. People get engaged if there's a positive opportunity and they get disengaged if it's all, if it's all catastrophe. And that is the new story we need to tell. You know, there are big four climate beliefs. One is, is climate change real? And most people accept that, yes. Is it human cost? Well, most people say yes. 32% say no. Is it bad? Is it something to be worried about? Well, 44% say no, it's not really bad. It's natural. We don't want to think about it. We la la la. But this is the main issue here. Is it solvable? The fourth dimension. Can humans do something with it? Or are we going to? We can, but are humanity going to solve the climate problem in this century? And look at this figure. 82% say no, this is going to go really bad. And if it's going to go really bad, why care? I mean, I can't do anything about it anyway. So, you know, why shouldn't I go and watch the lost rainforest while I still can? Why shouldn't I go skiing on the glacier before it's gone? You know, it's, it's going to hell anyway. So, so why? That's my story about the future, this society we're heading towards. So what we need is a story, credible, smarter, um, that commits us to a dream rather than a hell. And we could look at this guy, sold the dream. Sold the dream. I have a dream. He didn't say, we have a hell in front of us. We're all going to burn. He inspired social change by having a better story. And I think green growth or smart growth or uh, intelligent growth or we'll call it whatever you want is smart in the sense that we can use technologies to create more value while taking care of natural and social capitals at the same time. And I like the messages now coming up because smart green growth or intelligent growth, call it whatever you want, um, it's, it's more profitable than the 19th or 20th century model of growth 
It's also more expensive to, to continue as day. More and more reports are showing this, for anything from the new climate economy report to IRENA's last report. And I think one way of framing this very simply is to say, you know, the Stone Age, it didn't end because of a lack of stones. And the Petroleum Age will not end to a lack of oil or coal, but we found smarter ways to, to, do, to get out of the Stone Age, and we will find smarter ways to get out of the Oil Age. So the story is really, you know, we had a good century last year, some of us at least did that. Thank you, Oil. It's been good. Now the time is to move on towards smarter ways of investing and smarter ways of doing things. And the story we need to tell is a society where we have a higher quality of life while we have brought the ecological footprint downwards again. And then we need signals to show how we are moving towards this future story that we want gives us meaning and community. And we should no longer talk about the 400 ppms because we can't do much about them, but we can talk about signals that are personal, such as this example from a Norwegian bank, which shows this is my bank statement here. And this is my personal CO2 footprint based on what I purchased last month. So, and then, of course, it gets interesting if I can compare my purchases this year compared to last year. But even better, why can't I compare myself with my neighbor or with my Facebook friends? So you give the signals a personal dimension, so they are experienced as relevant. Also, you can do companies the same way. If you have a science-based target, for instance, reducing the carbon intensity of my value added by 5% per year, like this Norwegian company Tumra is doing, then they're doing their fair share. If everybody did like they did, we've solved the climate problem, and it's profitable. Make more money by using less. And finally, we do this on city levels, because I identify with my city. I love Oslo. I live in Oslo. Or if I live in Copenhagen, I love Copenhagen. And this is what it shows. Value added goes up while emissions go down. And if everybody did that by 5% per year, we have solved the climate problem by the year 2050. So if Copenhagen can do it, why can't we? This is making signals relevant to where we live and how we live. So let me sum up then. I asked in the beginning, are humans inevitably short term? Well, if we have only rational facts, it seems we are. Too bad. But humans are more than rational. We live according to social norms. My actions are influenced by what I think other people are doing. My actions are influenced by whether I have a negative or positive framing. My actions are influenced whether they are difficult or simple to do. I tend to do the simple things and avoid the difficult things. Also, if I have a story, it tells me about where we're heading as a community, it gives me a sense of belonging and a sense of meaning and a sense of direction, then I feel motivated. And finally, if I have signals on the feedback I'm doing, so we're actually making progress, then we will behave for the long term. So if more, one or more of these conducive conditions are in place, humans start to act for the long term. That's evidence-based. It's not something I'm saying for you know, my belief. This, there are studies showing this, the effects of these five conditions. And finally, I'm not saying that individual actions are sufficient to solve the climate problem. I'm not talking about it nudging because it fixes the climate air problem. But I'm talking about it because it shifts behavior. It reduces the barriers. It reduces dissonance. It reduces denial. Because if we behave in a climate-friendly way, then my support for policies increases. And there are lots of studies showing this as well. Like the ban on indoor smoking. Everybody was against it. Then it was implemented, and a few days later, everybody supported it. Because we see others are doing it, because it's a social norms, and I perceive the better, and I see the signals, better health, so I support it. And the same measures we need to do now, by taking these individual actions, we send a social and political message, increasing the likelihood that politicians and businesses will implement the structural changes that actually solves the climate problem. So that's my conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Pierre, for that uh, very thought-provoking and uh, challenging presentation. Uh, we do have time for questions from our audience here, and we also uh, can take questions from our uh, participants who are on the WebEx. 
So if anyone wants to send in a question, please uh, type it in, and we will see if we can slot, slot, slot that into the uh, into the discussion. But would anyone like to open up with a with a question? Michael. So you have to press, press the button. Um, thanks a lot for that very interesting presentation. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that second conclusion, because it's quite easy to find examples where people take a very short-term perspective. You mentioned smoking. I think pensions is another clear case. Um, but are there anything you could point to where this has actually been achieved in terms of um, people acting for long-term interests, particularly where the costs and benefits are not particularly aligned on them specifically, but there are major externalities. Um, so there's some new research on looking at uh, how um, policies, if implemented within a four-year period, particularly in the beginning, uh, can have uh, uh, an effect on behavior and thus policy support by the end of the four-year period. Uh, it's a new article, Weathering the Storm, by Elke Weber at Columbia University, among others. They study, for instance, the Stockholm uh, rush hour pricing uh, issue, because in the beginning, everybody was, well, more than 60% were against it. And then uh, after the rush hour pricing was introduced, uh, the people experienced they could get there quicker, and support for the policy increased over the period. Another uh, example is the British Columbia uh, carbon pricing. Uh, which also have seen increased level of support of, after it's been implemented, even if the evidence there is a little bit muddled, and depending on how you look at it. But I would like also to introduce better measures, because not just the carbon pricing, I'm giving that back over the income uh, taxation. But I think if people get got a monthly um, SMS um, back showing what their joint savings were, uh, rather than just having it invisibly uh, added on to your income taxation statement at the end of the year. You could utilize and combine several of these psychological with economic measures in a sense that creates salience. So for instance, there was this issue uh, among uh, the nudging unit uh, in UK, which looked at how do you get people to insulate their lofts, their houses are leaking heat and energy. And in the beginning you have subsidies for insulating your loft, but it didn't work. Why? Well, you know, it's a lot of hassle of cleaning out your loft and then getting insulation and then moving back all the stuff. So they started to, and, and then maybe you'd have to, you know, um, uh, some, do some electric uh, upgrades at the same time. And, you know, it was just too much hassle to going through all these steps. What they did was to bundle it all into one package. So you get, there was some people moving, cleaning your loft, other insulating it, and some a third in, uh, doing electricity adjustments in one package. So rather than having three different vendors going through three different processes, you'd have one, and that increased the take-up. So this is what I mean with, by combining these social norms with simple actions and then giving feedback uh, on them. Uh, and uh, in, my, in my book, I, I review these studies, and, and there's just one. I mean, it's like hundreds of them showing that these actually have an effect. What is lacking, of course, is the systematic application of this knowledge. That's why I wrote this book. We now know what actually makes people change behavior and behave for the long term, but we're not implementing it. And ironically enough, the scientists, the social scientists that are studying the science of science communications and criticizing the scientists for being too academic and too abstract and not using stories, they are publicizing in journals that are highly technical, unreadable for non-social scientists, and being very abstract because that's their way of doing it. So their, their interest in knowledge is not getting out in the same way that their climate scientist knowledge is not going out. So they're not applying the same principles to their own practice. And that's what I've been trying to help with. Okay. Catherine. Um, I'd like to thank you. That I thought that was really interesting, and I, I do the media outreach for environment and climate change, so it's very relevant to my work. And I realise I've been doing it all wrong <laughs> for the last years. Um, and now that we're just out of COP21, um, thinking about the way the international organisations and uh, climate change campaigners have been communicating. Um, my feeling is most of them were getting it wrong. Is there any organization or individual campaigner who you think was getting it right and doing what you're suggesting and going for the positive message? Yes, luckily I think, thank you. Yes, luckily I think there are lots of uh, outstanding uh, examples. Um, so um, in terms of, uh, let's do different categories here, in terms of uh, the opportunity framings. I think for instance, uh, Sustainia, uh, a Danish uh, NGO, uh, each year publishing the 100 
um, leading solutions on sustainability solutions that are being implemented. It's a wonderful, wonderful approach because they speak 95% <laughs> about the solutions. So I really like that. Also, I think, for instance, the work of DMVGL, uh, a Norwegian-German um, uh, certification company, has been publishing what's called uh, Global Risk Report and Global Opportunity Report. So in that report, they do a worldwide uh, stakeholder engagement and then speak about what are the most important risks that we are standing on. And they are, of course, experts on risk management. That's what they're all about, risk management in the shipping sector, in the petroleum sector, etc. And then what are the global risks? And then linking the risks to opportunities. So in this shift from cost and uncertainty, the big problems, problematic framings from science and economics, we should shift towards a risk management uh, issue and then look for the opportunities within the risks. So please look up those reports. I also think another report from um, the US called Risky Business, which was co-published by a bipartisan group, Bloomberg and Hank Paulson from the Republicans, uh, also did a good job because they're breaking down the global risks into local risks and business sector risks. So shifting this issue from a cost issue to a risk management issue and then putting a price tag on the risk you're running uh, is a great, great approach. Um, also, there's this guy called um, Bob Willard who had um, sustainability advantage, which makes businesses uh, easily, with a model on the internet, calculate uh, the commercial uh, return on investments of sustainability uh, initiatives. So by helping companies and societies look into um, the opportunities and then calculating these um, and communicating them in a positive frame uh, is, uh, is the way to move forward. I also like, for instance, the initiatives in the US now happening in terms of um, uh, community energy aggregation. So communities get together and then agree um, and use their collaborative and negotiating force to buy more and more renewable power from the utility and also um, get um, uh, local community benefits from uh, large-scale installation of solar panels, etc., in their local areas. Mm -hmm. Um, finally, I think using, for instance, nudging for, in, for having people choose uh, green energy compared to conventional energy. Uh, some studies show that uh, some German communities uh, where there's the default. Now, mostly, you have, when you sign up for electricity, you don't sign up for either green or brown. You sign up just for electricity. Uh, if the default, when you fill in the form for new electricity, it's already a checkbox for I want green electricity. This shifts it from I think 20 to more than 90% of the Germans in that area have signed up for purchasing only green electricity. Not because they are that green or environmentalist, but simply because it's the default. So using these methods, we can shift human behavior. And by shifting human behavior, we increase the bottom-up support for policy change. And that's what we need to get to a carbon price. I don't disagree with the carbon price. I would love a carbon price. But it's a long way to go before we get there. And just comparing economists over and over and saying, we need a price on carbon. I had this professor the other day at a seminar saying, what's the most important thing we can do? And he said, well, three things. It's price. It's price. And it's price. That's the most important thing. He didn't like the nudging approach. Shane, I believe we have a WebEx, uh, one on the web. A question from uh, our listener? Yeah, thanks very much. And for all of uh, you that have sent in your questions, there's many. Um, I'll just choose two. I think that would be reasonable given the time constraints we have. Um, the first one is, will law enforcement be useful at all and at what cost? That's from Barra and Para. Law enforcement. Law enforcement, correct, yeah. And the second one um, is an OECD colleague, actually, working on the OECD's inter-country input-output table. Uh, they've calculated the consumption-based emissions for 61 countries. So this question is relating to the carbon footprints. Now I'll get to the question, would the knowledge about your carbon footprint be sufficient to make you act to reduce the emissions? Um, and is the actual size of your footprint um, compared to your friends likely to make you act? Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, first, law enforcement. Uh, I think it's referring to the new initiatives, uh, for instance, from the Netherlands, where they succeeded in a, in a, in a case against the government uh, of uh, securing our uh, future environment and that the government was um, convicted of not doing enough. Um, I think that's a great approach. Uh, I, I would support that for all it's worth. Um, However, 
uh, it's a kind of desperate measure, uh, and uh, it might force politicians to do something, uh, but it doesn't really engage in my area, which is how do we communicate climate uh, in a positive, opportune, um, uh, opportunity way, uh, which builds more support. Um, if we get stricter climate laws, um, I would love it. Uh, but it's kind of outside this psychological approach. It's, it's working through the legal uh, system, which doesn't really impact uh, our psychology in that way. So I hope that's clear. I'm all for it. And it's not really an efficient way of communicating. It's, it's going through the back door, so to speak, towards. Uh, and, and the other question was um, whether uh, knowing my absolute footprint would motivate me to behave. And um, I think if we take the segmentations that, for instance, Yale has been doing, there are six segments of the population, from the completely dismissive to the alarmed. And it's about 13% who think climate is just bogus, and 13%, 15% who think it's uh, very important. And for the alarmed segment, I would say maybe just getting a personal footprint month to month would have a big effect. But for the unconcerned, or the cautious, or the dismissive, it would have zero effect. So then comes the question, would it help if I knew what my friends were doing? And then maybe yes, not, maybe not the dismissives, nor the, the disengaged, but those who are cautious or somewhat concerned, they would shift their behavior because now they see another friend who's doing this, and then it would be impact on me. So evidence tells us that if we move from an absolute footprint level to a relative one where I compare myself with the status, that has a huge effect. So the answer is definitely yes to that one, based on evidence. Leo Axel. Thank you, and thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, one of your points uh, was that you should give uh, simple messages and you, for instance, this is framing. yes. Mm -hmm. So you re uh, used uh, putting a uh, health angle to it as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but a large part of the action has to take place in the northern hemisphere, and in the northern hemisphere, I'm not so certain that uh, the health impacts of climate change will necessarily be so negative. Uh, if people in Norway had fewer colds, perhaps they would appreciate that. And, and, and people in Canada could also appreciate having fewer colds, etc. And um, so my question is, isn't there a danger that things will backlash if people start to discover that the message is a the simple messages are simply not uh, for their region. Sorry? For their region. Yeah, for their region. So they, they discover that the simple messages perhaps are not correct. So that's. You, you refer to comparisons with your friends, um, and you're not. You're normally on good terms with your friends, but in an earlier context, you talked about comparisons with your neighbors. And those who have looked at the impact of being compared to neighbors, have they asked, what are your relations with your neighbors? And if you have a conflictual relation with your neighbors, perhaps being compared to them will not really make you or, 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 or want make you change your behavior in, in the way you wanted us to, to, to change. Thanks for problematizing my very over, shall we say, uh, uh, overarching and maybe somewhat simplified presentation. Uh, first, when it comes to Nordic or Northern Hemisphere impacts of, of climate, uh, there are quite a few. Uh, it's been well documented, so just look up the latest version of Lancet if, you, if you're in doubt. Uh, they're issuing that last year. Um, for instance, the spreading of ticks uh, has a major health impact. Uh, for instance, the new uh, zones that are get accessible to waterborne diseases, uh, new areas get new uh, airborne um, uh, viruses. Uh, there is a change to the composition of, uh, of waterways. So, uh, and flooding, for instance, makes new kind of health challenges. 
So uh, it's been pretty well documented. So of course, when you do uh, climate messaging within the framing of health, you should stick to the available facts. You shouldn't make things up because that would backlash, as you say. Uh, so we need to do our research on this. But my main point still stands, which is that in series of, of experiments, um, framing within the health issue rather than the catastrophe of 2100 makes people more engaged and more likely to support climate measures. So, of course, you may find a few studies that oppose that, but the majority of the studies are very clear on this issue. So, for instance, if you say health or climate is a security issue, uh, we need to um, improve our mitigation of climate because otherwise we will be invaded or we get more refugees or more terrorism, uh, people are fleeing. Um, that is not necessarily as effective framing as the health issue. So these two have been compared, for instance. Second, will, if I have conflictual relations to my neighbors, will that um, reduce the, the influence? And of course, yes, in certain cases it might. Uh, however, you should know that in these issues, it's not my literal neighbor. It's not the guy I'm quarreling down, down with down streets. The, the, the graph I showed there was an average of people in that neighborhood. But of course, if you were somebody who is at odds with your entire neighborhood and all your neighbors, <laughs> are you know, stupid assholes, then of course probably it wouldn't work. But statistics show that on average it does work. So that's the evidence based. And, and if you don't believe me, please check the references I have. I'm, I'm, I haven't laid this up. I, I'm, I'm trying to give a, uh, an available summary of leading research in this area. I might get it wrong and the weighting may not be perfect, but I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm, please check my references in the book. So you probably have time for one more question before we uh, have to Wrap, to, wrap, to wrap it up. Any burning questions from? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Do you think this body of science should be brought into the IPCC? That's the perfect question for me. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> we are currently doing that. Uh, I was invited to an IPCC expert meeting in February in Oslo that discussed the communication of um, preparing a communication strategies for the IPCC AR6. And there are things in motion um, that was more like a communication perspective, uh, not necessarily the social science perspective. So we have done certain preliminary initiatives to have another expert meeting and probably an IPCC technical report on the consensus of social science on how to communicate climate science. So I hope that will emerge over the next one and a half years, something like that. I might uh, take the privilege or the honor of uh, wrapping up with one final question, and that's about uh, how an organization like the OECD, which works with the interface between policymakers and academia, uh, and increasingly with civil, so the civil society, if, if there's one message uh, we should take from your work, uh, your, your, your five S solutions, what, what would you recommend that we uh, focus on in, in terms of our communications on climate change going forward? And this is, Catherine's taking a special notes on this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think you asked me to pick one, right? Yeah. Uh, my one would be do analysis of what have the balance of framings been in the communications with OECD up to now in terms of climate? Mm -hmm. How much catastrophe versus opportunity? How much cost versus risk or and these kind of things? There are methods to do that, uh, like the, the, the Oxford Journal, Institute of Journalism are working very scientifically with the framing issue. And then shift the balance according to the, 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 some, the evidence we have from social science from cost and uncertainty to risk management and the communication of opportunities to a balance where there's three to one, 75% opportunity and 1% catastrophe and the cost side of it. So let's say 75 out of 25. That's, I think that's the correct balance according to human psychology. Depends on what you want. If you want human engagement, we know from psychology that you have to have a balance of the positive and what's possible to do. You shouldn't ignore what's negative and catastrophe. It must be there. It is facts. I don't ask the scientists not to tell what their facts are. I'm t asking to get the balance right. I mean, if you've been to some of the climate conferences over the last decades, 
How many times have you walked away from there with a feeling of inspiration and hope and <laughs> we can do it attitude? How many times have you walked away there with a bleak feeling of this is going to hell in both of it? Good point to finish up on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Stockness, we uh, thank you very much for, your, for taking time to come and talk to us at the OECD. Wish you all the best for the uh, continued work on this topic and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing a lot more about uh, your work in the future. So thank, so thank you very much. <laughs>